When the Challenger 65 rolled onto farms in 1987, it represented something the agricultural world had never seen before. A major construction equipment manufacturer, known for its iconic yellow bulldozers and excavators, had created a rubber-tracked tractor specifically designed for farming. The machine promised to change everything about how farmers worked their land, and for 16 years, it did exactly that. But then, in early 2002, Caterpillar walked away from the entire project. The manufacturer sold off the Challenger line and stepped completely out of the agricultural business. What happened? Why did one of the most innovative tractors ever built get abandoned by its creator? The answer involves corporate priorities, economic hardship, and a fundamental mismatch between how construction equipment gets sold and how farmers actually buy their machinery. The Challenger program had roots stretching back to the 1970s. Engineers at Caterpillar had been experimenting with ways to bring their crawler expertise into modern agriculture. The company tested various prototypes, including a Red D4 belted tractor built around 1980. This experimental machine modified an existing D4 SA unit by replacing steel tracks with flexible rubber belts and incorporating a truck transmission to improve speed and handling. The goal was ambitious. Caterpillar wanted to create a tractor that combined the flotation and traction of steel tracks with the versatility of rubber tires. After years of development, the Challenger 65 emerged in 1986 and hit the market the following year. The original machine packed 270 gross horsepower from a turbocharged and intercooled 10.5-litre engine. Its rubber tracks measured 24.5 inches wide and were reinforced with steel cables bonded into the rubber. Production began at the manufacturer's Davenport, Iowa facility. For farmers, the Challenger offered genuine advantages. The tracks delivered more than 50% greater traction in the field compared to wheeled tractors. Ground pressure stayed low thanks to the larger contact surface. Farmers could pull heavier implements with less slippage, and they could do it without compacting their soil the way conventional tractors did. By 1991, the firm upgraded the original to the Challenger 65B, boosting power to 285 horsepower and improving reliability throughout the drive system. Throughout the 1990s, Caterpillar kept developing its agricultural lineup. In 1995, the corporation introduced row crop tracked machines with the Challenger 35, 45 and 55 models. These smaller tractors ranged from 175 to 225 horsepower and featured adjustable undercarriages that could be set from 60 to 88-inch tread widths. CAT also struck a deal with German combine manufacturer Klaas in 1997. The two firms formed a joint venture to manufacture and retail Lexian combine harvesters in North America. These machines wore Caterpillar branding in the signature yellow and black colors. Meanwhile, Klaas would market the Challenger tractors in Europe in its own green and white livery. Caterpillar seemed committed to becoming a full-line agricultural equipment supplier. It was adding tillage tools to its offerings and had built a new factory near Omaha for combine production. The DeKalb, Illinois plant continued churning out Challenger tractors. But beneath this expansion, serious problems were brewing. Glenn Barton spent 43 years at Caterpillar, eventually becoming CEO in 1999 and serving until his retirement in 2004. After he left the company, Barton explained why the organization ultimately abandoned its agricultural ambitions. The manufacturer faced what Barton called a distribution issue at the end of the day. Caterpillar's dealer network had been built for construction equipment. These were large dealerships, often located in metropolitan areas, that served contractors and mining operations. They sold bulldozers, excavators, and earth-moving equipment worth hundreds of thousands of dollars each. The typical cat dealer operated far from rural communities. Agricultural equipment sales worked completely differently. Farm implement dealers operated through what Barton described as a very decentralized network, with many dealerships in small towns close to farmers. A grower buying a tractor expected their dealer to be five or 10 miles away, not 30. 
Of the 75 to 80 Caterpillar dealers operating at the time, Barton estimated that only 15 or 20 had a really good opportunity for the agricultural product. The rest simply weren't positioned to serve farming customers. This created a fundamental competitive disadvantage against established agricultural brands. John Deere and Case International had spent decades building rural dealer networks. Their green and red signs stood on main streets in farming communities across the continent. A farmer with a broken tractor could get parts and service locally, often the same day. Caterpillar couldn't match that infrastructure, and building it would require massive investment. While the distribution problem festered, an economic downturn struck the construction industry hard around the turn of the millennium. The recession that officially lasted from March 2001 to November 2001 hit equipment manufacturers particularly hard. Caterpillar's primary markets, construction and energy equipment, slumped along with the broader economy. The company that had posted record profits just a few years earlier found itself struggling to remain profitable. This created what Barton described as a clash of priorities at a time when the economy was soft. The corporation was underfunding its cash cows, meaning its core construction equipment business, while simultaneously investing heavily in agricultural development. Every dollar that went toward expanding the Challenger program was a dollar that didn't go toward maintaining the company's dominant position in bulldozers and excavators. When senior management examined what additional capital investment they would need to make the agricultural business truly competitive, they were talking well in excess of $100 million. Much of that money would need to address the distribution side, building out a dealer network capable of serving farmers properly. For a company struggling to make a bottom-line profit, that investment simply couldn't be justified. Despite all these factors, Barton acknowledged that selling the Challenger line was a tough call to make. The tractors themselves performed excellently. Farmers loved them. The rubber track technology worked exactly as promised. But the company could not escape the fundamental reality that the Challenger just didn't fit with most of CAT's dealership network. Senior management recognized they would have to compete from a zero ground standpoint to take away market share from the market leaders. They didn't have the marketing strength their dealers had with construction products that would allow them to win in a tough battle against market leaders John Deere and Case. In December 2001, Caterpillar announced it was selling its Challenger rubber track tractor line and the decal factory to Agco Corporation. The sale closed in March 2002, ending Cat's venture into agriculture after just 16 years. The corporation took a pre-tax charge of about $80 million for asset write-downs, including the plant and equipment. Meanwhile, Agco paid an undisclosed sum to acquire the design, assembly and marketing of the entire MT series of Challenger tractors. Under the arrangement, the construction equipment giant would continue developing and supplying components for the machines, including diesel engines and technical support. The yellow paint would stay on the tractors. Cat dealers who wanted to continue selling agricultural equipment could do so. But ownership had transferred. The sale created years of confusion among farmers. Some Caterpillar dealers in Canada continued selling the Challenger, and because the tractors still used cat-built drivetrains, they continued carrying the manufacturer's decal on their sides for some time after the sale. This confusion extended beyond rural communities. Barton recalled being interviewed by Maria Bartiromo on her television show after the sale. She opened by asking about his outlook for the ag business next year. His immediate response surprised her completely. We are not in the agricultural business, he told her. Bartiromo was taken aback. She couldn't believe Cat was not in the agricultural business. She didn't know what to ask next. It turned out to be a shorter interview than what she had planned. ACO, meanwhile, moved quickly to capitalize on its acquisition. The Georgia-based corporation organized a separate worldwide challenger division to market the new equipment line through Caterpillar dealers globally. By September 2002, AGCO had received commitments from 51 CAT dealers in the United States and Canada to represent the challenger product line. The key to AGCO's success lay in its fundamentally different approach to agricultural distribution. As Barton himself acknowledged, 
The conglomerate knew how to work the farm distribution system better than Caterpillar did. Agco had built its business by acquiring agricultural brands and managing multiple dealer networks simultaneously. The corporation owned Massey Ferguson, Fent, Heston, Gleaner, and numerous other farm equipment names. It operated through small dealers scattered across rural America, exactly the kind of network that Caterpillar lacked. Agco could sell one brand of tractor in one area and another brand in another area. This flexibility allowed the company to slot the Challenger into its existing distribution structure rather than building something new from scratch. Shortly after the acquisition, however, Agco determined that the decalb plant couldn't be sustained. Production levels were not sufficient to support a standalone track tractor site. In March 2003, the corporation announced it would close the Illinois factory and relocate Challenger production to its facility in Jackson, Minnesota. That move added approximately 100 new jobs at the Minnesota plant while consolidating operations. Under Agco ownership, the Challenger brand continued evolving. The new owner expanded beyond tracked tractors to include wheeled models using machines manufactured at various Agco facilities. Combines and hay equipment joined the lineup, all wearing the familiar yellow paint. For years, Challenger tractors kept using Caterpillar diesel engines. Eventually, the huge firm transitioned to its own Agco power engines to meet increasingly stringent emissions requirements. The most powerful version, the Challenger MT875B, earned distinction as the most powerful production tractor available during its run, delivering 580 engine horsepower. In 2007, and the unit set a world record by tilling 1,590 acres in 24 hours while pulling a custom 46-foot disc harrow. But by 2017, Agco began consolidating its brand portfolio. The Challenger name was dropped from Europe, with those products shifting to the Fent brand. In 2020, they started phasing out the Challenger brand entirely, focusing instead on promoting Fent as its premium global offering. The Caterpillar Challenger story illustrates a fundamental truth about the equipment business. Having superior technology isn't enough. Distribution, service and customer relationships matter just as much as the machines themselves. Caterpillar built arguably the most innovative agricultural tractor of its era. The rubber track system genuinely improved farming operations. Farmers who used challenges rarely went back to conventional wheeled tractors. But the company couldn't overcome its structural disadvantage in serving agricultural customers. Its dealers were too far away, too unfamiliar with farm operations, and too focused on their core construction business. When economic pressure forced difficult choices, the agricultural program became expendable. Caterpillar retreated to what it knew best, leaving one of the most significant tractor innovations in decades to someone else to carry forward. Today, the Challenger brand is fading into history. Akko continues producing the tracked machines, but increasingly under the Fent name. The yellow paint scheme that once marked these distinctive tractors is giving way to Fent's green livery. Yet the technology Caterpillar pioneered lives on. Both John Deere and Case now offer track versions of their major tractor lines. Rubber track systems have become standard equipment for large-scale farming operations worldwide. The manufacturer that built the first successful rubber-tracked farm tractor didn't profit from the revolution it started. Sometimes in business, being first isn't the same as winning. What matters is whether you can support your customers where they actually are. Caterpillar, for all its engineering brilliance, simply couldn't figure out how to do that in agriculture. And so it walked away, leaving behind one of the most interesting chapters in modern tractor history.